volume expanders is the term given to a group of fluids that contain osmotically active agents that in theory will prevent leak of fluid from or even recruit fluid into the vascular space. Colloids, by definition, are preparations of homogeneous, non-crystalline substances that are dispersed in a water-carrying solution. This carrier solution usually has an electrolyte composition similar to the crystalloid preparations discussed already. Because colloids, in health at least, cannot cross the capillary endothelium, the fluid distributes within the vascular tree. For this reason, it was believed that the effective expansion of the blood volume was similar to the volume administered, much more efficiently than saline, which readily disperses across the extracellular space, requiring three to five times the total administered volume to achieve the same vascular volume expansion. However, there is little evidence, particularly in certain patient groups, that there is any meaningful difference between colloids and crystalloids in terms of transcapillary fluid leak and tissue edema. John Myberg is one of the world's leading researchers in resuscitation fluids. Based at the George Institute in Sydney, Australia, his work has included high-profile ANZIC's clinical trials group studies, SAFE and CHEST. It's probably true that uh, in conditions where the the endothelium or the blocker calyx now is intact, the colloids probably exert more of a predictable and increased osmotic effect um, in maintaining intervascular volume in patients who are volume depleted. But as you know, once endothelial permeability is lost, which occurs in virtually all sick patients, um, that um, ability to retain fluid within the system is often lost. Um, and as a, as a consequence, it appears that the extravasation of fluid into the interstitial space uh, is probably the same with colloids and crystalloids. In fact, he says, the leak of fluid into the tissues may paradoxically increase tissue edema with their use. Commonly available volume expanders include albumin, starch, gelatins and dextrans. Albumin is a naturally occurring protein with a molecular weight of 66 kilodaltons. In health, it is the major plasma protein, constituting over 80% of the overall colloidal osmotic pressure of the blood. Albumin is made by either confractionation in cold ethanol or chromatographic purification of pooled plasma from blood and plasma donations. In order to improve safety, Albumin solutions are heat treated to 60 degrees for at least 10 hours, a process known as pasteurisation, then incubated at low pHs to deactivate potential viral pathogens. All plasma donors are screened for prior exposure to certain infectious agents and donations are tested for the presence of certain viral markers. Albumin is delivered in a carrier solution, often a crystalloid similar to normal saline. Additives such as octanoate are used to protect the albumin against heat and oxidation during manufacture and storage. Albumin also contains minute quantities of pre activator, which has been associated with hypotension and bradycardia in patients on ACE inhibitors. However, the levels of PKA in current generation albumin solutions are significantly lower than in previous generations, resulting in a substantially lower rate of hypotensive reactions. While much has been made of the effects on fluid flux between body fluid compartments, albumin may also have important antioxidant and transport functions. Human albumin solutions have been available for over 70 years, used mainly for volume expansion. Albumin has also been used in the treatment of hypoalbuminemia, and for specific conditions such as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, for encouraging fluid removal after ARDS, and for fluid management of burns, haemodialysis, plasma exchange, and in cardiopulmonary bypass. Albumin solutions are available in two general formulations. Albumin is often administered in a 4-5% to 5% concentration by weight, 
which is roughly iso-oncotic when compared with normal plasma. This has two major effects. There is a limited risk of hemolysis due to the changes in tonicity and minimal fluid shifts in or out of the vascular space due to changing plasma oncotic pressures, thus retaining its effect in the vascular tree. The albumin, with a plasma half-life of around 20 days in healthy volunteers, is known to stay in the circulation. In some studies, over 80% of infused albumin is still present in the circulation at two hours. Concentrated albumin solutions are used to increase the oncotic pressure within the vascular tree. This results in a shift of fluid from the extracellular space into the vascular space, increasing effective circulatory volume. These solutions are usually provided as a 20 to 25% concentration by weight. Taken together, these points mean that in healthy people, 4 to 5% concentrations of albumin increase the vascular space by about the same volume as the volume infused. In other words, if you infuse 500 ml of 4% albumin, you would expect that at 2 hours the vascular space would still be expanded by over 400 ml. Given this, it would be expected that pulmonary function would be better protected by using albumin compared with crystalloids by preventing increased pulmonary interstitial water. In available studies, this does not appear to be the case, and one possible explanation is that pulmonary capillaries are relatively permeable to albumin compared with other tissues, resulting in fluid leak into the pulmonary interstitium and the alveoli. Despite their widespread use in clinical practice, until recently, albumin solutions have not been subjected to rigorous outcome-based clinical testing in large, randomised controlled trials. The SAFE study, completed in 2002, is the largest trial to date of albumin for resuscitation in this field and will be discussed further in a subsequent video. Concentrated albumin fluids are most of use when there is excessive extracellular fluid where the concentrated albumin assists in drawing fluid back into the circulation. This has been particularly effective in resolving acute lung injury patients. In contrast, if the patient is euvolemic or dehydrated, this process will further dehydrate the ECF and have a flow-on effect causing cellular dehydration as ICF flows out. As a result, hyperoncotic albumin solutions are not recommended for resuscitation. An unplanned benefit of the SAFE study, which looked at the role of 4% albumin in fluid resuscitation of critically ill patients, was quantification of what had been recognised by clinicians for years. Normal values change in critical illness. One of the things that the SAFE study ta uh, taught us, I guess, were a couple of process measures. One of them was that the normal serum albumin of an ICU patient is 25. The patient comes into the ICU, into hospital following his or her trauma or operation with an albumin of 40. Within a very short time, that albumin is almost halved to 25. And this is probably an acute phase response to, to injury and stress. And therefore, if you're going to quantify or measure or, or treat an albumin level, then in fact, um, that level of 40 is, 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 is way too high. As John Myberg explains, the permeability of the vasculature to proteins like albumin may totally change during critical illness. And so therefore one of the major reasons why we gave colloids uh, is, is now increasingly questioned. Of course, one of the concerns of this is that uh, if uh, increased edema occurs in vulnerable tissue beds, particularly the brain or the myocardium or the kidney or the gut, um, colloids may in fact have a paradoxical effect on worsening organ function rather than preserving it. An under-recognised property of 4% albumin is that it too is relatively hypotonic, with a mean osmolality of 260 milliosmoles per kilo. It has been suggested that this is a plausible cause for the increased mortality and raised intracranial pressures in brain-injured patients in the albumin group of the SAFE TBI study, a subgroup analysis of head-injured patients in the SAFE study which is discussed in a subsequent video. Albumin solutions are very expensive to produce and distribute, though in some parts of the world, 
the product is free of charge to some providers. This considerable expense has led to the development of several semi-synthetic alternatives. Hydroxyethyl starch solutions, known as HES, were until recently the most commonly used resuscitation fluids in ICUs globally. HES is derived from starch, or amylopectin, obtained from either potatoes, sorghum or maize, which has undergone hydroxylethylation. Starches are characterised by their molecular weight, and the degree of hydroxyethylation, described as a decimal where 1.0 is completely substituted, and their concentration. For example, the most common current formulations are HES 6% 130 on 0.40, indicating a 6% solution by weight, a molecular weight of 130 kilodaltons, and 40% substitution. Similar to albumin, HES is suspended in a crystalloid solution, the constitution of which will vary with the manufacturer. Hydroxylation retards the normal degradation of starch by plasma non-specific amylases, prolonging its duration of action. This is seen as a benefit in that it will prolong the practical half-life of the solution in the vascular tree. However, the prolonged activity may also lead to complications. Because of this potential, daily dosing recommendations have been between 33 and 50 mLs per kilo per day. In addition to the benefits of starches on volume expansion, background studies had linked the newer starch preparations to attenuation of the inflammatory response, mitigation of endothelial barrier dysfunction and vascular leakage, while maintaining gut endothelial integrity. For these reasons, starches were adopted globally with great enthusiasm. Recent evidence, however, has seen the use of starch grind to a halt. John Myberg was the principal investigator of the CHESS trial, which compared starch and saline as a resuscitation fluid in ICU. And so we felt in Australia we had the same imperative to answer a question to determine the safety of starches uh, in our patients as we had with the Cochrane question posed the safety of Alvin. We were in the unique position of being a starch naive society. We had the experience of doing, of doing safe and therefore we thought it was very important that we do a, a trial similar to SAFE. And in fact, CHESS was modelled on SAFE without apology uh, to determine the safety of this new preparation that was going to hit our shores in large volumes um, as soon as possible. It was very important, says Myberg, to answer the question of safety. Powered. The CHESS study was specifically powered to look at an increase in death at day 90. Uh, looking at a 3% absolute risk reduction, as we did with, 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 with SAFE, and power to look at an increased use of RRT in patients. And as you know, the results of CHEST show that there was a, a not a, a statistically significant increase in risk of death, but the porn estimate certainly was on the side of saline, unlike SAFE where the porn estimate was identical. It was a 6% relative increase in death uh, at day 90 with starch, um, but a significant increase uh, in uh, the use of RRT if patients should receive starch. This effect size was 25% relative, which is a substantial increase in the use of RRT. Similar effects were seen in a post-hoc analysis of the VICEP study and in the Scandinavian 6S trial. In the latter trial, not only was renal failure more common in the starch group, but mortality was increased too. Interestingly, says Myberg, the impacts on renal function appeared to be linked to the dose of starch given. And all the effect sizes between the low dose chest study, the intermediate success study, and the high dose bicep study were all consistent, which would appear that the use of starch is associated with a dose dependent tox toxic profile, a dose dependent increase in risk of death, and it appears that it's probably a class effect attributable to all starches. Renal failure risk is particularly associated with higher substitution versions which are now no longer part of clinical use. Additional complications from HES include pruritus and interference with coagulation. HES is thought to disturb coagulation measurements 
and while the impact in practice is unclear, concern has been reinforced by the finding that in some trials, HES is associated with an increased need for blood products. But how does this harm occur? Anders Perna is the principal investigator of the 6S trial. There is a direct effect on coagulation, uh, so it marks up with probably the fibrinogen networking during clot build-up, and therefore it causes uh, um, bleeding and increased use of um, blood products. That's one side, and the other side is tissue deposition, uh, tissue uptake. So even in healthy volunteers, as much as half of given starch cannot be accounted for at 24 hours, meaning that it has left the circulation and entered tissue, and, and here it cannot be de degraded. And this most likely causes at least kidney failure, but may also cause chronic inflammation because it's a foreign body in, in other tissues. Um, so I think when you put it all together, the, those two explanations are the most likely. Further muddying the waters for starch enthusiasts was the discovery that a leading German researcher who was heavily involved in starch resuscitation fluid research was fabricating his results. In 2011... 88 of Joachim Volt's 102 papers published since 1999 were retracted amid accusations of failing to obtain ethical approval for his studies and fabricating study results. Another group of colloid substances are the semi-synthetic molecules known as gelatins. Gelatins are created by hydrolysis of bovine collagen with further modifications such as succinylation, in the case of gelafusin, or urea linkage in that of hemocell. Gelatins are relatively inexpensive to produce and allow approximately 80% of the infused volume to remain in the circulation after administration. Allergy is probably the greatest concern with these products. There are also concerns raised about renal injury with gelatins, with a recent observational study associating it with renal injury. Given there is little evidence available to suggest they outperform crystalloids on any hard measure and there is mounting evidence of harm, it is hard to justify their use in practice. Dextrans are preparations of D-glucose polymers that have colloidal type properties. They are characterised by their molecular weight. For example, D40 has an average molecular weight of 40 kilodaltons. Like starches, clearance is slower the larger the molecular weight. While at one time dextrans were considered a potential volume expander, due to issues with bleeding resulting from platelet effects and the high risk of allergic reactions, they have largely fallen from favour. They can also cause hypotension and interfere with cross-matching of blood products. D70 is now rarely used, and only D40 has a clinical application, largely as a novel anticoagulant. I think the important thing about fluid therapy really is that, is that really there is no ideal fluid for all patients at all times. You've got to really think about fluids as drugs, and uh, before you give a bag of fluid, think what are you trying to do with the fluid, what are you replacing, how much are you going to give, if you don't get an effect, what will you do? All fluids that you give accumulate in the body over time. Crystalloids and colloids um, produce edema over time. Edema is bad. And uh, short-term gratification of getting five mils of urine in the bag may in fact cover the cost of patients' well-being days down the track when they are waterlogged, still on the ventilators with acute kidney injury. In this video, we have reviewed many of the commonly available fluids for use in the ICU. Each fluid has positive and negative attributes and a detailed knowledge of this is required to ensure fluid prescription is optimal. In the next video, we'll review the issue of volume resuscitation.